Hi, everyone. It is that time again. How are you guys today? Good to see you. I've had a great day already. So, um, as you can see, I did another geometry around this thing, which is like, I think probably now the most complex geometry I've ever done. I've got some coloring still to do to finish it. But um, I, in the process, discovered an entirely new geometry I've never drawn before or seen before. So um, we're gonna draw that today and I'm gonna show you how, how, uh, how to do that. But um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, it's made of what appear to be uh, sort of hyper-dimensional uh, triangles in a sense that they're in perspective. And um, this is gonna help us also in a discussion we're gonna have about perspective today and perspective art. Um, it's also made up of hexagons. And you can see the hexagon form right here, but it's in a uh, hyperdimensional perspective form of the hexagon. So it really gives you this illusion that it's popping out at you. Again, made with all these lines of Metatron's cube. So you're seeing this geometry, and I don't, don't even know what this would be called yet. Um, so it's a hexagon, a triangle, a triangle, a hexagon, a triangle, triangle, hexagon, triangle, triangle, hexagon, and then a central, a center hexagon as well. So I don't even know what this would be named. Um, I'll have to look it up. But um, it also has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so 18 sides uh, around it in two dimensions. So let's go ahead and get started on this one. This is gonna be an exciting one. Let's see if I can recreate this. Okay, Put this right here. Get us a fresh piece of paper. And good news, I was able to find some more pencils that I had stashed somewhere. I didn't know I had stashed. So uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. I don't have to run off to the store to get any pencils. So now we've learned, you guys already know. Let me show you one thing real quick. You've learned all these basic forms and you've even learned the hyperdimensional forms of these particular drawings. So. We have here the uh, tetrahedron, and you have a cube. You also have a star tetrahedron, which is two tetrahedrons, uh, basically merging. You have an octahedron here as well, so the octahedron. And these are all the hyperdimensional forms of these, so you've already jumped to kind of the advanced class. You also have an icosahedron, and this is a breathing form of the icosahedron. So again, hyperdimensional. And you've even learned the hyperdimensional form of the octa cube octahedron. So, and the dodecahedron, which is right here around this, and the octatoron. So congratulations, you guys have all learned that now. And uh, you've sent me some really cool drawings, so fantastic work on that. So, now, we're not gonna draw a bunch of nested stuff today. We're gonna draw this new geometry uh, that I literally just discovered. Um, and I mean literally just discovered, I really mean just this morning, in fact. So let's start from scratch. You guys are now moving up to more advanced level stuff, so might as well keep this fun and challenging for us. So we'll start with our lines. my glasses back on. Okay. Okay. Always gives us a great opportunity for grounding when we draw that cross. The cross is a symbol that's been around for a long, long time, even before the days of Christianity.
I'm using a different compass today. Uh, the reason I'm using a different compass is because my other compass lead fell out and I didn't have time to go ahead and replace it. And uh, this already had one in place. But you'll notice that I actually had to use my pocket knife, my trusty pocket knife, to sort of carve this down so that I could get a more fine point on it. Because sometimes when they come in the box, they don't actually uh, come sharpened. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, another thing I had to do with this particular compass is that it's one of those compasses that has uh, multi-directional. So you see a screw right here and another screw right here. I freaking hate those things because they end up coming loose just at the moment you don't want them to come loose. So I tape them. Drives me insane. If I wanted to do a different shape, I'll just basically move this. So I don't understand why that's even there, but that's okay. I'm sure it's some other purpose that I'm not thinking of using it for, but here we go. Okay. So the way we're gonna draw this geometry is we're gonna start off just like we normally do by making Metatron's cube, right? So let's make Metatron's cube by doing our normal approach to that. And of course, as you know, we could start with Flower of Life and Flower of Life would get us there too, but uh, we don't need to do that today. Maybe next time I'll do a, a very advanced Flower of Life for you guys. Okay. So now we're going to draw our female and male triangles. Now, geometry today isn't really a journey of discovery as much as it was in the old days. Now, when you look back in history, Virtually all the philosophers from Plato and Socrates' time all the way to today were somehow always working in geometry. And it's because of Plato that we have the name the Platonic Solids. So there's something about geometry that tends to bring out, I guess, thoughts about philosophy and life in general. And that's probably why I named this class Philosophical Geometry. Okay. All right, so now you know what, I'm not happy with that line right here because it didn't exactly, I think my ruler may have moved a little bit, so I'm gonna redo that line. It wasn't horrible, but enough that it was gonna bug me. Now this time we're gonna draw a whole bunch of lines on Metatron's cube. So this is gonna be a fun exercise. And you'll see what I mean about discovering geometry. So let's go ahead and cut this across right here. Remember, every once in a while, you have to kind of like wash your ruler, which I did not do. Um, let me see if I can make it a little bit better because it's carried it from my last work. See, you pick up some of this trash from whatever the last thing was that you did. But easy to correct, okay? So now, let's go into more detail on this. In fact, maybe, let me see if I can. 
Let's see if my other ruler will help me from over here. It's cold. This looks cleaner, but. So now you're going to draw from each point to the center points on the inner hexagon. Just like that. So we'll go around and do this to the far sides. So you've got two on this one. You're going to want to have two from emanating from So, you know, there was a, Plato's teacher was a fellow by the name of Socrates. Socrates' most famous quote has only two words in it. And it is the most difficult thing any of us will ever do our entire lives. I'll tell the story about Socrates and how he ended up dying it's a pretty incredible story. Actually, what had happened was there was this battle at sea. And uh, I believe it was between the Greeks and the Persians, the Peloponnesian conflicts. And uh, basically what had happened was the generals and admirals upon their return from uh, being abroad in this fight came upon a storm in the Mediterranean. The storm was very severe. And so the, the person in charge, the admiral, in the peak of this storm was concerned that he might lose his ships and might, you know, lose several men. And, uh, in fact, the storm was so severe that several of the men fell overboard and, and would likely perish unless the ship stopped to find the men. And actually, um, the admiral said, no, let's keep going. And, you know, we're going to lose them, but the rest of us will at least survive. Well, there was a big controversy about this in the Senate back in Athens because several people, and maybe it was because some of the sons or whatever of the, uh, maybe some of the men that died were related to some of the, uh, the members of the Senate, don't know exactly, but they were quite upset that the admiral uh, made this decision to sacrifice a few people in order to save what he believed the rest of the, the fleet, or at least the people on his ship. You know, sacrifice a few for the sake of the many. And, um, and so this became a huge debate. Now, by the way, what we're doing here is we're drawing a line from each point now to these points. So that means you're going to have on the ones on the opposite side. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So, sorry, six points are now going to come off of each one of these. So we're going to be drawing, I drew, drew the first two already, one, two, so I'm going to draw the others right here. So uh, it became a topic of discussion in, this, in the Greek Senate, and in the process, uh, people asked Socrates for his opinion, and I believe he was an old man at this stage. He was already kind of in his late 70s or 80s, 
I don't know the exact age that he was at the time. But he had been become very famous as a philosopher, but he was very outspoken. He was kind of an interesting character. He would use humor and wit um, to get by. Kind of reminds me of the Roman character Cicero, if you know Roman history that much. But basically, so there's our points. One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. So you're basically connecting to these points here. And we're going to go around counterclockwise so that we get these all, we don't miss any of them. So they asked him his opinion about whether or not, you know, the general or admiral in this case uh, should have left the men at sea to perish or if he should have turned his boat around and gone back for them. Like no man, you know, left behind type of thing. And Socrates, as the story goes, sided with the, uh, with the, with the general. He said, look, you know, we can't, no man can know what the situation would have been, right? It's kind of like a woulda, shoulda, coulda conversation. Um, but, you know, let's not question the, the decision process of the, uh, of the general here. And the Senate got very angry at him, and they asked him to retract his comment because everyone's going kind of one direction. Now, just to stop there, I just put... Six points in one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to keep doing this around. And I have to remember that I had split this one here, so the actual point that I'm wanting to connect to is this one. It's, not, it's no longer the first, it's the second one. So you have to remember what you've done there. And so they asked him to retract his statement because it wasn't going the direction that they wanted it to go. They weren't, he wasn't substantiating their claims of, you know, being right. So they, because he wouldn't retract the statement, they sentenced him to death. And the death was by poison, in fact. And the poison being hemlock, which works similar to a, a neurotoxin. It's a poison that will like uh, kind of start at a certain point in your body and then sort of it leads to paralysis and then eventually asphyxiation and death. And Plato, who was his student and mentee, pleaded with him to take back his position on this or, or recant it. And Socrates refused. And he said, look, I'm ready to die anyway. And of course it took several hours but the whole uh, account of this is, I think, in, in a book called uh, Plato's Timaeus. And so the great Socrates, the great philosopher, whose most famous quote is a very simple, know thyself. Know thyself. And uh, the world lost Socrates. But this so impacted Plato that he wrote about it. So now, see what I'm doing? I'm just adding more of these lines going around and it's gonna give me all these lines of perspective. So I gotta remember, okay, it's this, this one right here. It's not the first one. So it gets a little confusing. You know, right here is the one I gotta go to. Know thyself. Two words, sounds very simple, but actually the hardest thing I think any of us will likely ever do. We spend our entire lives looking outward to solve the riddles and the questions of the world because we think we know who we are and what we are, we perceive our separation. But what if actually the answers were all within you. And that the great riddle itself was actually, if you could spend your time, instead of looking outward for answers, that you turn inward. And that turning inward would provide you the most profound 
of insights. What is the world? What is this experience? Who are you? Why are you here? Age old questions that many men and women, many generations over have asked. And yet Socrates gave one simple prescription. Know yourself. I've been watching this show um, at night. It's actually, I think it's a German production or something. I'm not exactly sure, but it's, it's called Freud. And um, I like to do it when I'm doing geometry because I can listen to it. And I don't have to actually uh, watch them kind of like looking like they're doing a kung fu movie with bad dubbing. <laughs> when I'm doing my geometry, I can mainly just listen to it and that becomes another kind of methodical thing for me. But it's interesting watching this life of Sigmund Freud, who really was probably the pioneer in introducing the concept of a collective unconscious. That the self is not only that which you perceive as separate, but actually much deeper than that. That you could think of your personality in a way as like uh, the tip of an iceberg where the iceberg thinks it's separate from the rest of the world around it. There might be boats on the surface of the water. There might be birds in the air. There could possibly be, if it's not a cloudy day, a big sun up in the sky. And if an iceberg could be conscious and sentient, then maybe the iceberg would think that's all there was to the world. and never even know that there was a huge part of the iceberg that was underwater, submerged. So now have a look here. First of all, what's just been formed out of this is something that I have given a name to of an octoract, where you could see planes, right? Here's a plane right across here. Here's another plane right across here. In fact, it's almost as if these things are coming off the page at us now. And, and so then it's a stellated form or a stellated, um, you know, octoract, which is a tesseract that is, uh, you know, several cubes basically merging in and out of each other. So that's one way we could go with this. Or we could go an entirely different way with it. Okay. Now let's also draw some other lines of perspective here. We're now going to go to the other side. So right here, so this exact point on the hexagon right here is what I'm talking about. We're gonna do the same thing on the other side right here. So more lines coming into play. You know, we have two of these for each point. So back to the iceberg. So the iceberg could perceive that its entire world is separate from it. But maybe what's in the outer world is just a projection of what's underwater. The part of the iceberg that is submerged. Let's call that the subconscious. So that, in a sense, its universe is its you inverse. Because we cannot separate bias, we can't separate our own subjectivity and judgment from all of our experiences. So therefore, we are perceiving separation, though none actually exists. And secondly, we are thinking that all of this separation is completely running independent of how we're perceiving it. Well, I've already kind of said this a few times that 
what happens to us is probably 90% what we believed happened to us and 10% what actually happened to us. I had an extent, example of that this morning where somebody called me kind of distressed that they hadn't gotten something that they were expecting to get. And right now, you know, it was related to money. So they were kind of freaked out and they immediately went to this place of, uh, they're laughing about it now, by the way. They immediately went to this place of, oh my gosh, this was intentional, this is bad. Somebody pulled a fast one on me, blah, blah, blah. When actually, no, it was just a clerical error. And those types of things happen all the time. But, you know, you can almost see how it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if that person had gone and attacked the other party, which thankfully she did not, but had they gone and attacked the other party, the other party might have gotten really upset which would not have served any good purpose and may have actually ended up in a similar outcome to the one that they thought was already happening. And I think all of us do that all of the time, literally. Okay, so now we're gonna play a game of connect the dots. So I'm gonna put this in a very, very dark, bold uh, kind of coloration, as it were, in my lead. So I'm gonna connect this second point here and this second point here. And so normally, if I were gonna be doing a dodecahedron, I would draw a line right across here that would connect these two points, but I'm not this time. So I'm gonna draw a line that cuts across right here. Okay, see that? Now let's do that the exact same way all the way around. So normally it'd be this one, but I'm gonna to go to this one. So it's basically the third inner line, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, same thing again, one, two, three. Two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So let's just say that Freud and Carl Jung are right. Because we cannot separate our own bias from our experience in the world. If we could perceive it differently and perceive everything as emanations of the self, yourself, and that the experiences you keep experiencing over and over and over again are experiences you're experiencing because you need to learn something. And let's say that you don't know how your subconscious can communicate with you. It doesn't communicate directly with you. Maybe it communicates to you through numbers and synchronicities or maybe other things. Who knows, maybe that communication might include some form of astrology or something. And that what you need to experience over and over and over again are the things that you're having a tough time learning. So would you learn by learning the experience you need to learn? So if you need to learn compassion, would your world be surrounded by compassion? Or its opposite? I propose you're gonna get a lot of its opposite. That in fact, if you need to learn something like the concept of unconditional love, what you will continue to experience over and over again will actually be 
something closer to betrayal. Now, isn't that an interesting concept in and of itself? So, now, let's see if we can find, so let's reference back to our picture here. So we can see here this hyperdimensional hexagon right inside here, right? Which is emerging out of this. Okay. So now how can we find that within this particular construct? So we know it's going to be related to something related to probably this line right here because this line is is what is oh i know what I, what it is <laughs> okay so that's right now go another layer i forgot about of course so it goes one two to that layer yep and it must go right into here It's gonna go to Okay. So that gives you one, two. see oh here we go this is how you see this stuff guys yep there it is there we go see it's about plucking out the patterns how do you pluck out now there's one way to do it here, or we could do it here. And I think the way that I did it was actually here, yeah. So let's go with this. There we go. Now you should start to see this structure. Right? Um, emerging. So it's gonna go that one. Yeah, that's right. That is right. There we go. Now, you can see, here's your hyperdimensional hexagon. It just got formed out of that. That's kind of cool. Now, let's take this to the next step. Because then the next form should be coming right off of here. And it is. Just like this. Sometimes it's difficult to see it the first time. But then what we're going to have to do is we're gonna have to connect this line here, right? So this one's gotta go to the center here and it's gotta go right up against that. So just like this. Okay. And by the same token, now I'm going to draw this to the center line right here. And then you're gonna start seeing this geometry emerge out of this. I can erase some of these edges to make it easier to see. So then it's gonna go back to, so 
this line right here. There we go. And this, my friends, is how we discover new geometries. So you see that? There's your hexagon. There's your hexagon. All right, and it'll start getting easier and easier to see this as we go around. And then all of a sudden it just takes shape and form. Now I'm gonna lighten up. I don't have to fully erase it, but I'm gonna lighten up these edges pad here and this will help you see it better you see that Hexagon in perspective. It's just emerged out of this. And geometry is all about finding the symmetries and the structure. You can also see the little triangle that got formed right here also. So now you've got this quite easy to see. And then, this is another triangle right here. Now you can start to see this thing taking shape, right? So let's keep going around. And the structure goes like this. Okay, and then I'm gonna take this angle right here, just like over here. I go from the center here to where it is crisscrossing that point. Uh, where'd it go? Okay, so I'm gonna now take this edge off from the center point here to right there. Just like that, you can bold that a little bit more. And I'll erase this edge right here. See that? So it's going right up against from this point. It's going to basically be right off of this, so then I've got my, yeah, here we go. Okay, then the other side comes just like this. Take these lines, take this edge off. Can you guys start to see this thing forming now? And this is what discovering geometry is. It's basically finding all these types of forms amid this mess of lines that looks like there's no pattern to it. And isn't that very similar 
to deciphering the universe itself, in a sense. I would propose to you that it is. Once you kind of crack the code, it makes it much easier to start going around like that. Now, notice this could also take a pentagonal form in hyperdimension. You see this pentagon right here? You got one, two, three, four, five sides, but we're creating out of this the structure of the hyperhexagons, which give it that perspective. So then, from that, we're now going to take this edge. Let's see. Okay. So we now need to go from the center point, which is right here. And the center point is going to go right to there. There we go. edge off. It's kind of metaphorical to life too. Taking the edges off our personalities is uh, an important part of life. So whenever you see me post a new geometry, um, this is generally what I'm doing. <sighs> Finding out of this mess of lines and then trying to see if it's already a known geometry, which is easier for me because when it's a known geometry, then I don't have to name it. And it's a pain in the ass to come up with all the Greek words for this, for naming these things. So I actually like it when <laughs> when it's already a known geometry and I can just say it's, oh, it's a different perspective on, right? That's always better for me. But um, very often these days, I'm getting totally new ones. And every time I get totally new ones, um, I notice a change. Somehow consciousness shifts again. And not just you know, and a shift in consciousness is a shift in your perception. How you perceive the world around you is more important than what actually happens to you in that world. Two people could be presented with the exact same circumstance and one could perceive it as heaven and the other could perceive it as hell. You know, once I was, uh, I was in Japan and I, I uh, met this Buddhist monk, and he said to me in Japanese, I speak Japanese, and part of the reason why I think I found this mathematical kind of stuff is because of language. You know, mathematics is a language, and I speak eight languages. And I've noticed we've got people on here from all over the world, so I lived in Germany for three years, that's how I learned German. Everywhere I lived, I ended up learning the language because I thought it was the best way to learn the culture. And um, I speak French. I also speak Korean. I lived in Korea for two years. And I also speak uh, Japanese. So when I was in Japan, this guy, basically, this uh, Buddhist monk says to me, What's the difference? Do you know the difference between heaven and hell? And I said, no, but I, I think you're about to tell me. <laughs> and, um, and he said, well, in heaven, or in hell, rather, there's abundance all around you, you. And so you perceive no abundance. And the reason why you can't grab it is because you have these super long fingernails 
I thought super long fingernails, like the kinds that grow like in the Guinness Book of World Records. I remember looking at that when I was a kid. These super long fingernails. And, uh, and you can't pick anything up. I thought, wow, this is definitely a, a Japanese analogy. Because I don't think we would use this analogy in the U.S. or in Western philosophy. But it actually turned out to be a really good one because he said, in heaven, all the exact same conditions exist, even the fact that you've got these super long fingernails. The only difference is that in heaven, you use the fingernails to spear the food and the abundance, whatever it is, and you share it with everyone else. I thought, wow, that's profound. And so then it becomes a heaven. And all it took was a change in perception to change one experience, which was perceived to be hellish, and turn that same exact experience into a heaven. If there's one thing that you take away from these from these classes, whenever this is finished, this coronavirus is done, it's that. I hope that you start to see and perceive the world differently. That rather than reacting to the stimulus because you perceived it as a negative stimulus, try the opposite. Just try it and see what happens. In that situation, even the worst things that happen can somehow turn into blessings to your life. No matter what those things are. So now look, here we go. We're just about there. And we now have a new geometry. You guys have done something few have ever done. Okay. So now let's, let's give some extra perspective to this and I'll go really fast on this. So you can see. The reason why I chose this particular geometry um, when I discovered it to be the surrounding structure for the very complex geometry we worked on yesterday is because it had a nice open hexagon right to the center. So we could see all the cool stuff that we drew very nicely without having a bunch of overlapping lines. I could still enjoy the increased complexity, but I don't have to cover up all the central stuff. I don't need to cover up the subconscious to enjoy fully the higher degree of complexity that we place on the outside. Now, it's probably some metaphor also for life, don't you think? That we tend to place a lot of complexity, but usually we're placing that complexity around ourselves in order to hide the aspects of ourselves that we don't want to allow others to see or experience. The things that we're ashamed of, the things that we carry guilt over, those things don't really add a lot of value to our lives, do they? And yet we harbor them and carry them sometimes for what may feel like and might actually end up being lifetimes themselves. So can you guys see this new geometry emerging, the structure? It came out of K-1. 
chaos, the centropy that has now been released from what we had perceived as entropic. Actually, it wasn't entropy at all, was it? It's just a pattern we couldn't perceive until now. Which I think is kind of beautiful. That there's so much more to the universe around us that we're not perceiving, it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that we haven't perceived it yet. I didn't do as light of lines as I usually do on these structures on the inside because I know I wanted you guys to be able to see the lines. But I can go over these with a, an eraser and hide them, which of course I'll do. Now, Anyone who comes up with the proper name for this geometry, if you can find it. I'm not claiming it's an entirely new geometry. It might just be a new perspective, and I just haven't seen the other ones yet, or the, uh, where this is already recorded, a series of hexagons and triangles. But I would really appreciate if you found something, and if you do, I'll post it, so send it to me, and I'll post it because I'd like to know that I don't have to name this thing. So I've frankly run out of names. Okay, so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Just trying to put some extra lines of perspective here and before we run out of time. So you guys can see what I mean. But I think you generally have the idea already. There's nothing more powerful in the universe than a mind. See what I'm doing here? It's real simple. Nothing super complicated here. Keeping it simple. And yet it is here. All right, so I think that's bringing us to the end of our hour. Uh, such a pleasure to spend time with you guys today and um, wish you all well and keep expanding consciousness, keep expanding your perspective and much love to you all. And uh, if you put comments on, I can also probably respond and answer uh, some of these comments as well as they uh, as they come up. But uh, such a pleasure to be with you guys today. I started a little early today, so I'm going to have to finish. Um, but I'm reading some of the comments here, and I could not agree more. The only problems are those we self-create, 100%. <laughs> and yes, it was recorded on Facebook. So love to you all. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you tomorrow.